Well, you guys are in for a treat today. I interview Seth Feldman, who's a principal at a charter school in Oakland, California. They're doing some amazing things, some things I've never heard of other schools doing, and we dive into all of it, so I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. So enjoy this next episode of the School Success Podcast. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the School Success Podcast. I'm your host, Mitchell Slater. I'm joined by a new friend, Seth Feldman, who is the executive director and principal of Bay Tech Charter School in beautiful Oakland, California. And this school, guys, is doing a ton of things that are new and exciting. We're going to talk about AI, different softwares, the way they're testing kids. We do it. We're going to dive into all of it because Seth is kicking butt and taking names over in California. But I don't want to take away any of his thunder, so I'll pass it over to him. So, Seth, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit of what it's like to be in the life of Seth. Well, Mitchell, first, thanks for profiling our little school in deep East Oakland. We're a fantastic school. We are one of Oakland's oldest charter schools. That's our claim to fame. Uh, we've been around for nearly 20 years. We've been in five locations <laughs> in 20 years. And uh, that's another one of those exciting things. We're always on the move and doing things a little bit differently. Our school is a sixth through 12th grade. We are 100% free and reduced lunch. We are 100% graduation. Wow. And we are, last year we were 100% for our African American students, UC A through G readiness and 90% for our Hispanic students, UC A through G readiness which puts us near the top of not only schools in Oakland, but schools in Northern California. And as our kids will tell you, if you get a D, you're not going to get your degree. So at Baytech, mm -hmm. one of our claims to fame is Ds are not passing at Baytech. And that's wow. a, a big difference between us and most of the other area schools is that you must get a C minus in order to pass and move on to the next grade. And it's very exciting because if you want to come and be a student with us, Mitchell, you can be there at one of our three summer school sessions. <laughs> we have a very long schedule. We have Saturday school. We have three sessions of summer school. We have summer camp for our sixth graders and all new students. And we are a, a sexy school in <laughs> deep East Oakland. Holy smokes. Okay, a lot to dive into. I would love to know why did you guys specifically pick the C minus rating over D like a traditional school? Why did you guys go with that route? In California, the University of California and the California State University systems do not recognize D's on a transcript mm -hmm. as that student having taken that class. So if you're applying to a school, say you're applying to, you know, one of our schools we feed to is San Francisco State University, which is a fine institution. And you would say, yeah, I have three years of college. I have three years of math. I have ninth grade algebra. I have 10th grade geometry. I have 11th grade uh, trigonometry. But you got a D in 11th grade trigonometry. You are not considered to have had three years of high school mm -hmm. math. So okay. one of two things happens. Either you don't get accepted or they immediately place you in a remediation class. And so at Baytech, we are both a college and career ready organization. So even if you weren't going to college, but you wanted to go into the union or the military, so say you're going to the military and they look at your transcript and they go, oh, you failed all of these classes. What do you mean? Well, the D's don't count when you head into the military so you, you have to get a higher score on the ASVAT. So traditional Oakland schools, they're just interested in you getting out. You get a D, it's considered passing, you move on. So if you look at the local schools where we are, they're roughly 40 to 60%, depending on the school, you see CSU, what we call ready. Whereas we're greater than 90%, you see CSU readiness. So that's why that D is really important. You get a D, you're with me all summer long. 
Man. And so, all right, these kids that, you know, go to the school, let's say that they're, they're struggling, like they are struggling. Are they, do you feel like there's a lot of pressure on the teachers or is there a lot of pressure put on the teachers to go, man, I really need to like get them tutoring or maybe like try and bump them up a little bit if I can so that they pass. Is there a lot of that going on? And how do you guys handle that if kids are struggling? Well, it's interesting. So we just, it's funny you mentioned this, you know, it's, uh, it, it's not even uh, seven o'clock in the morning California time. And we just sent out a, a letter to parents today. We uh, have identified a group of students who are one grade low below. So they're not two or three or four or five. We have special programs for remediation. And by the way, we don't use the term remediation. We use the term acceleration. Our kids aren't broken. They don't need to be remediated or fixed. All of our kids are involved with advancement. So the parents of this group of students that received a, uh, the letter said, hey, your student is one grade level below. They are so close. In conjunction with their ELA teacher, their math teacher, and their electives teacher, we have special pullout tutoring that we want to do this second semester to get them right to grade level. Now, one of the things that's special about our school and why students do so well at our school, because we get students, our feeder pattern in sixth grade happens to be from a group of schools that are on the lower performing end, both charters and district schools. So it is not unusual, and we know by school, for our sixth graders to come in on average between second and third grade in math, and between third and middle of third grade in English. Hmm. So we use assistive technology so that every single student gets personalized learning at their instructional level. So if you are in the class and you are a sixth grader, we have many of these that are at sixth grade level, and you're a sixth grader that's at first grade level, you, the first grade level, are getting instructional instruction at your level, which is most likely phonics, word recognition. If you're a sixth grader and say you're at the eighth grade level, you're getting English language arts or math at the eighth grade level. And if you test out of middle school, because our assistive technology program that we use ends at eighth grade, we have another assistive technology school program that goes all the way through the fourth year of college. And so these programs are a little bit controversial because they're gamified. You collect coins, you go on hunts, you do mazes, and you, you gamify it. Now, we even do this in the summer. We have the iReady Olympics in the summer, so we don't get the summer slide where kids compete for T-shirts, sweatshirts, Baytech swag, um, and we have the iReady Olympics, and it's perfect in Olympic years. In non-Olympic years, it doesn't make sense to the kids, but it was started in the Olymp one of the Summer Olympics. So that's what makes our school kind of different and unique. We don't do any interventions. We do all accelerations. There's an accelerated humanities class for those students in middle school that are three grades and below in reading. And then we use a YUP on-demand 24 hours a day, seven days a week, math tutoring. So if you are uh, coming in in second grade and your seventh grade teacher, Mr. Norman, gives you a math assignment and you're like, I don't know how to do this. You can do it on your own. You could do it at a group at lunch. You could do it with Mr. Norman at lunch. You log on to the computer, you talk to the tutor, and you step-by-step -step instruction. And that's why you'll find... We'll talk a little bit later on about this. We just did our second interim assessments, and we found that roughly from beginning of the school year, we had 4% in seventh grade on grade level in math, and right now we have 22%. And the kids that were three grade levels or below were at roughly 60%, and now they're in the 40s. So you see that growth that takes place. We are a growth school. Our students are on the acceleration path. Love it. Well, obviously, you're having tons of success for all these different grades you guys service. Have you guys thought about expanding that to 
be a full K-12 school? Is that something that's in the car- playing cards? We would love to be a full K-12 school. We'd love to open up a second and a third location. Unfortunately, adult behaviors in the county where we are in Alameda County, California, within our school district, the Oakland Unified School District, do not allow for do not allow for expansion. I will say it's kind of one of the big frustration points for us as a school. We are a very successful school that's really not well liked by our by the governing board of the local school district. They feel as though we are stealing their children. And as I had to tell one of the board members, I don't remember the Oakland Unified School District having a uterus. So they don't own these children. These children partner with their parents. And together, they find a school that works for them. And that is one of our big pain points is adult behaviors. And I'm assuming... That's obviously a big pain point. I'm assuming if you were to, if you were to break it into three, if you could say, "Hey, these are the three ones we're kind of up against on a regular basis that we are dealing with." What would you say that is? Um, and you can elaborate on that first one you already mentioned sure. with um, behaviors. But what else would you got? I would say the three pain points for us: one is local politics being a charter school. We always have to worry about being closed because the local election from the school board. Uh, is either run, you know, they, they were, we're not unionized. So the unions have decided, oh, we're going to go after all of those non-unionized charter schools and close them. And so those adult behaviors. See, mm-hmm. at Bay Tech, we run our school for students. And the adults that come to our school are recruited fully knowing that adult behaviors are secondary. Student behaviors come first. And in the area where we live, it is very clear that adult behaviors drive what goes on both with the resources of money and time and drives conversations. There's more conversations about adults than there are children locally. And in our school, there's only conversations about children. And conversations about adult needs happen privately and happen with our chief of staff or me or the two principals. And just like good teaching, adults need differentiation. And so what might work for one adult isn't going to work for another adult. So we don't have a set of you all or I call it the thou shalts. Thou shalt all get this. Because it doesn't always work that way. What if they need something else as an adult? It's why I believe our teacher retention rate is well above 80% for the last two years, while in the area, local school districts and those surrounding areas, that hovers between 40 and 50%. Mm-hmm. We're able to give teachers exactly what they need, but it's not the focal point. Focal point is on kids and kid behavior. I think the second pain point for us is financing of special education. We are about 30% special education students. We love our special education students. We take all of our students. So if you come to Bay Tech, we just have a lottery. If you get in through the lottery, you get in. We don't ask any questions about language status. We don't ask any questions about special ed. But the funding of special ed has been static. And right now, our students need substantially more mental health resources than the funding through the special education, local education authorities, and the states are allowing. So we need to dig deep into our general fund to provide the mental health counseling for all general education students. And then our special education funding Our special education funding, because we do it the right way, it costs about a million dollars a year on income of about $700,000. So between dipping into the general education pool for mental health funding and the pool for for special ed funding, we're we're sometimes strapped for um, 
funds to do some other things. I think the third thing that no one wants to talk about, it's big for us, is inflation. The Biden administration does not recognize that inflation on food services, inflation on staffing for instructional aides, noontime supervisors, front desk staff. We're no longer competitive. We used to be competitive, right? You could make, and for some parts of your listeners, they'll go, oh my God, you can make $18 an hour. That's crazy. Well, no, because um, the local restaurants, fast food restaurants are paying 20, 21, 22. And because we're free and reduced lunch, we provide everyone with lunch, and the governor here in California did away with um, having to put in the forms. So oftentimes the state government and the federal government, they do not talk. And so what seems like great state government policies are terrible policies because now we're not putting in uh, where the parents are like, well, I don't have to fill out that form. Like, well, you do because for the federal government, I need this. Oh, no, no, no. My kid's school says I don't need it. So in order to get reimbursed for the lunch programs, we need forms that the state government has said, oh, no, you don't need anymore. Right now, there's terrible. I'm going to do a 3A. Right now, there's a, a terrible disconnect between the state, the local, and the county governments, their orders regarding COVID, their policies that they put together, and because they're not communicating with, enough, with one another, they're often working at odds with each other. Hmm. And that costs a school like us a lot of money for administrative tasks that should be going to students, particularly more teachers to have lower class sizes. Our class sizes at Baytech are roughly 20. I would like to get those class sizes down to 12 to 15. That's one of our secrets of success is that our class sizes are super small. So when you asked earlier about what, you know, is there a lot of pressure on teachers to get students to grade level? Yes, there is. But also our class sizes are in the middle school, they're no greater than 20. And at the high school, they average 20 in the academic classes. So you mentioned the teachers that stay on board, 80% are, are sticking around, obviously dealing with inflation and pricing. So what else are you guys doing to keep that so high? That's a high number. And obviously other schools are struggling to, I mean, this is a huge thing across the country. Everybody's talking about can't get teachers, can't pay them enough. Um, they can't keep them because they're going somewhere else. So what are, what are other little secret sauces maybe that you guys are doing in the teacher realm to keep them to stay? We have a general philosophy that teachers and people in general, you know, I'm a second career educator. I was in the business world for 20 years. I ran pretty large, you know, multi-billion, you know, the last not-for-profit I worked for had a billion dollars in their endowment and I was one of their mm -hmm. senior managers. And one of the things I learned a long time ago, are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. Leaning in. People don't leave jobs. They leave bad bosses, they leave toxic environments, and they leave places where they are disrespected on a daily basis. Mm. And I think those are the real secrets to success. Our staffing is, uh, we, and it's really interesting because we would rather start the school year off with me or one of the principals in the classroom then hire someone that doesn't fit into our, our system. And I, I, I teach. I teach summer school. I teach the first session. I teach freshman English. All those new freshmen that come in that don't recognize the Baytech way and there's a large amount of Ds and Fs until they, they get it right. They understand. I teach. So it's not as though I'm not in the classroom. And the same with our principals and you know, even our dean. Our dean teaches a peer mentor class, which is an elective. So she's in the classroom, Dr. Smith. People leave bad bosses. In the case of education, people are leaving bad systems. For Baytech, every one of our teachers has a California valid teaching credential. So it's not as though 
we have teachers like, oh yeah, they're teaching at Vatech because they don't have a teaching credential. No, teachers all have teaching credentials. What it is is they left a system that kept telling them how bad their job is every mm -hmm. single day. If I were 22 and handsome and young with a full head of hair like I was at 22, there is no possible way I would ever go into education because if you listen to the education establishment, particularly the unions, and you look, go on Facebook and you go on Instagram, it's all about how terrible this job is. Why would you go into a job where the major unions are telling you you're going to be disrespected, treated poorly, we need to fix this immediately, people are leaving in droves. Oh, yeah, I think I'll invest in that. And so at Baytech, we've gone out of our way to make sure that is not what is happening. And it's about behaviors. Now, does it help that we are probably the top paying school in the area? Yes. Does it help that our benefits are outstanding, that every, every teacher gets, instead of an assigned benefit, we give them a pool of money that they can spend on their benefits and they have a chart on how they wish to spend it? Yes. Does it help that we have flexible PTO time? Yes. Um, but that's not why people stay. They stay because they're respected and our environment is one of kindness and one of love and one of caring, both for kids and adults. And I come from the traditional school world. I was a principal at a unified school district and everyone was treated the same. We wouldn't do school that way. Why do we do adults that way? That's so good. And I love that because I think people miss that sometimes of how people will respond if they're loved and respected. I mean, if you go into a, a, let's just go to a restaurant and you start being mean to the, the waiter or waitress, like, you, you know, maybe you still get your food, but you're probably, she's probably not gonna be super happy or he's not gonna be very happy with you. But if you're very kind and courteous, you're typically, the service is gonna be a little bit better because they're like, oh wow, you're like really nice. I'll give you a perfect example. I went into uh, Dunkin' Donuts the other day and I walked in and this lady was there behind the counter and I was like, hey, can I get the, the blueberry donut? And she's like, sure. And I was like, how are you doing today? And she just like looked at me with these big eyes. She's like, I I'm doing okay. And I was like, okay, great. I said, do you know if that, that other donut's really good or whatever? I was just making small talk. And she's like, I haven't actually had it before. I was like, oh, come on now. You work at Dunkin'. You haven't tried every donut yet. How am I supposed to depend on, you know, just messing with her. And she, I paid for my food and I started to walk out. And she goes, hey, I just want to say thank you. I really needed you today, like for my day. And I was like, oh, that awesome. Like, and I, you know, walked out with my donut. And so I was like, man, it does, it takes, it costs nothing, nothing to be kind and to, to love people. Well, it's and interesting you mentioned food. So when I was young and, and in shape, I was, uh, I had a job at Friendly's, which is an ice cream chain mm -hmm. in the East Coast. And I wanted to be a waiter because waiters made better tips. But I worked instead the takeout window. And I asked my boss one day, I'm like, why, why am I on the takeout window? I, I want to move up to waiter. He said, oh, because you sing. I always would sing Where Do Broken Cones Go. It was a Whitney Houston song, Where Do Broken <laughs> Dream. And I would do Where Do Broken Cones. And he said, and you know, we get so much compliments about the guy at the window who sings. And FYI, you drive the tips for the rest of the building. And so that had that stuck with me. And I probably did that when I was 18, 19, 20, those three years. That has stayed with me, you know, for three plus decades, that how you approach your work, I was just the front scooper dude. I scooped ice cream and sang to people. Oddly enough, that drove the behaviors of the customers. And I will tell you as a school leader, how the school leader treats their teachers is exactly how the teachers treat their students and how the students treat each other. Mm, come on. It's a trickle down philosophy. And you know, when I'm on campus and I know, I know every kid's name, I'm not on campus every single day, 
I know every kid's name. I know their mom. I know their grandma. I know their aunt. I know something about them. And because of that, so do our teachers. And because of that, kids tell us stuff. And they're able to, we're able to either help them or help one of their friends. It's also in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment such as Oakland where there's massive declining enrollment amongst all schools while we are at full capacity. Hmm. Now, I tell the story. I was there Friday um, and we're dealing with COVID like everybody else. And I, what was I doing? I was working the front desk. You know, there I was. I was. I was answering the phones with my very bad Spanish. Hola, mi amo, director Feldman, mi español de malo. Un momento, por favor. You know, <laughs> and, you know, and then one of my students, my TAs, will take the call for me. But, you know, at the front desk, you're talking with, you know, there's a mom that came in. How are you? I know, you know, you were battling cancer last year. How's it going? And she said, you know, I, I tell everyone that, that this school reminds me of what it used to be like to go to my Catholic school. She was a Catholic school student in the in the 80s. She said, you know, you know my name, you know where I live, you know my my kid. You know, last year when we were really suffering, you managed to get us some food. I'm like, yeah, that's that's what schools do. And I think that's one of the differences between a system and everyone's so worried about treating everyone equally. Between a system and a school. A school is a community. A district is a system designed to not get sued. Mm. <laughs> that's, that's good. It's true. So we've dove into all these, uh, these pain points, things that you guys are dealing with and going through, which sounds like you guys are still doing good despite all that. But let's go into some wins. What are things that you guys, and I know you've even touched on a few already, you guys are just kicking butt at. Like you are like, we are rocking it in these three departments. If you could put it into three. I would tell you one of them is family relationships. The last year during COVID online, we had roughly 95% participation every day where mm -hmm. other schools were like, what's going on? And it's because uh, the principals, me, and a team of people, our care team, we actually have a team called the care team. And we would go out and knock on doors. Because there were, you know, was no discipline, no thick. So it's like, oh, look, Mitchell hasn't been here in three days. Let's knock on his door. And there's a great story last year where the principal and I went to a great kid. I love this kid. Um, he was a ninth grader. He was with us in middle school. And he hadn't been on for days. And I watched his grades go down in the D range. And I was targeting him for honors classes that start in 10th grade. I'm like, no, this kid needs to be in the honor. What? Hmm. I'm going to have to kill him, right? So we just knocked on his door, said hi to his dad, logged in, sat with them, waved at the rest of the Algebra 9 class, said hello. And they were like, Dr. Feldman and Mr. Hughes are in his house. But yes, they are. But we hand-delivered art supplies. We hand-delivered food. We hand-delivered computers. We hand-delivered hot spots. You know, we only have 365 kids. But we started off the year in COVID hand-delivering welcome signs. Welcome to Baytech, to every new student. And because of that, the family relationships are pretty tight. When we call a family, whether we call them in English, in Spanish, in Tagalog, in some other language, they come. And they don't always come because the kid's in trouble. Sometimes they come because the kid did something really great. We make just as many phone calls for when your kid does something good because we want to build up that credit in the bank. It's a banking system. And when something's not great, sometimes you have to make a withdrawal. But if mm. you haven't built up that credit, if you haven't done those things you're supposed to do, you have no credit to draw upon. So our family relationships are pretty tight. Okay. I think the second thing is our kids just want to be at school. This year they started a bunch of new clubs. We started the, uh, the student government, started this year strong. The leadership school, the leadership class is very strong. The kindness campaign that they, that they ran for the whole school was pretty strong. And our kids want to be at school, which is different from past years when they had to be at school. And a lot of our students recognize, especially the ones that have come from other places, that this is a, 
a place where it's safe. People come to Bay Tech because it's safe, because we know everybody's name, and we're not afraid to call your mom, your grandma, or your auntie. I mean, that's the bottom line. And I think that kids want to be at our school. I think the, the last thing that's gone well for us is the use of assistive technology to help personalize learning and kids finding success. And that, I think, has been really important for us because I came to this field of education from a coaching background. I was the men's varsity soccer coach and track coach from another school, and I coached club soccer. And I used to say, I used to coach 13-year-old boys. And people would ask me, Seth, with all your crazy talents, you know, you're a college coach and a high school coach, why do you coach 13-year-old boys? And I said, because 13 is when kids give up the sport. They recognize, I'm not good at this. I put in too much time. I'm never going to be any good at this. I'm going to do something else. And there's study after study after study that shows that. Well, we know the same thing has to be true for sport, uh, for school. I don't read well. I'm not good at it. I'm going to do something else. And usually that something else in other schools is either goofing off or misbehaving or getting suspended. We did a study on bathroom log uh, two years ago. And we looked at our bathroom logs, and we correlated our bathroom logs to the assistive technology scores. And we realized, huh, all the kids with really low, low scores on assistive technology, they have the world's smallest bladders. <laughs> because they go to the bathroom every single period of the day for 15 minutes. So through the use of assistive technology and data, We've been able to say, no, you have to sit here. And then we kind of ramped up the gamification a little bit. And so we got them hooked. And the assistive technology is what makes, it's what, it is the tech in Bay Tech. Most people think it's coding or it's working with computer. Every school has that. We use more than 10 assistive technology products. The one that's right for the kid. And we infuse it into our day. We have a, a school day that's a little bit different than other schools. It doesn't look like a traditional school, but that works for us. Hmm. Well, sounds like you're answering what that school day looks like, right? <laughs> well, let's, what's it look like? Let's see, because we're going to, and then I'm going to wrap it up because I, we've been, this, this one could easily go on for over an hour, I know. So what's the day look like? And I'll ask you one final question. Well, it's kind of funny. Our day it really does feed into the whole concept of community. In non-COVID, so up, up until two weeks ago, our day looked like this. For risk management, we've had to stop it, but we have variation. For non-COVID, the entire middle school starts the day off in the cafeteria eating breakfast and reading the same book in small reading groups. So everybody mm -hmm. reads the same book. And then we move on to our day and we have lunch. After lunch, you move into what's called Eagle period because we're the Eagles. An Eagle period twice a week is assistive technology at your grade level for English and assistive technology twice a week, your grade level in math. So you get built into your day every single day instruction at your instructional level. At the high school, every day starts off with us delivering you breakfast and you reading the same book. And then after lunch, you use a different program, which is uh, more ninth through fourth year of college. That's assistive technology for English, assistive technology for math, assistive technology for Spanish. In the, high, in the middle school, assistive technology is also into social studies and into Spanish. So if you look at our day, we begin the day, everyone begins the day the same way. Everyone transitions the day and starts over again after lunch. In the end of the day, eagle takeoff. So we have eagle landing, you land, eagle period, and eagle takeoff, and you go home. Everyone walks out, single file, with their teacher in a calm and orderly manner. Wow. And so the day looks very different than a traditional school. 
and being charter school, is it bus buses pick them up or is this all parent pickup? How does it? Uh, uh, we are bus pickup. Uh, we don't provide busing, uh, but there's a public bus across the street. You have to understand where we are. Our kids come, our sixth graders last year, we had 32 different elementary schools. We only had 56 graders. So our kids come from all over the, the, the area, not just one concentrated area. And it's why I'm so interested in school choice, because it's not easy to go to our school. Roughly 90% of our kids get dropped off in the morning, which means parents have to be inconvenienced. And there's something about our school where they're willing to say, I'm willing to be inconvenienced. And they raise their hand. In the afternoon, it's very different. The public bus can take kids home. We have a robust after-school program that stays open until 6 o'clock at night. Those kids both get a snack and dinner. And uh, we have a, a very robust uh, partnerships with University of California, Berkeley. So we have a lot of uh, beginning teachers on campus till late in the day. So oftentimes parents come and go. Our sports program is pretty robust as well, even for a charter school. Man. So, okay. So I'm curious, kid, uh, before I ask you that, you know, final question, and I got a couple more you just made me think of. So what, what kid, what's the farthest a kid comes to, to, to your school every day? You know who the farthest away yes, is? Yes, I do. We have uh, children, we're in Oakland. We have kids who started with us and have been with us for a long time. And their parents moved to Stockton, which is about an hour and a half away. And they decided, you know what, I'm gonna graduate from Baytech. So they did their junior and senior years. And we don't have just one kid from Stockton. We have several kids that come from Stockton. We have a teacher that comes from Stockton. Whoa. She's been with us for nine years. We have students that come from Antioch, which is a different county and it takes them about an hour to get there and we have one family that comes to us from Vacaville which is on the other side so it's an hour and 20 I think it's an hour and 25 minutes not quite as far as Stockton they're an hour and 30 minutes um, so yeah we have uh, now 90% of our kids come from uh, the Oakland area okay. but that 10% comes from far 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 away and when you say hour and 20 minutes, traffic or no traffic? Uh, that's probably, uh, you know, I don't know. In the morning, it's an hour 20. In the afternoon, it's probably two hours. But I know that particular group of kids plays basketball, so they're not leaving. So this is their day. They show up at 8.15. We feed them breakfast. We feed them lunch. And then they leave at 6 p.m. And they wow. get home around eight. Man. So they are they are twelve hours a day as high school students commuting. And that speaks volumes of your school, of course. If people are willing to be like, I gotta I wanna stay with the school and, and travel that far. Cause we all, we know California has no traffic, which is nice. There's no traffic right. at all ever. So um, shouldn't take that long. But no, that's awesome that they were willing to go that far. I feel like I guess I'd wanna be the same if I was with a school, knew all my friends, my teachers, and was excelling and having all these opportunities, I'd wanna continue to go to continue to go as well. See, there's one other question. Oh, is your school also one of the ones, if you don't get in by the middle school, you're not going to have a spot because it's everybody just continues to move up and there's not really a ton of spots that open up because no, everybody just we, that's not – so we don't have football. So 6th, 7th, and 8th grade is pretty tight. If you apply by the deadline in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, uh, which is February 4th, you will get in. But in eighth grade, and it's kind of funny what happens. It cracks me up. Eighth grade, we get this group of boys. They all want to play football. All of them. So we usually lose about 10 to 12 kids between football and, and uh, other sports. Um, and then 11th grade, we get a knock on the door. Can you take us back? So our school is always looking for students because we have we lose a lot of kids in from eighth to ninth grade. And then in ninth grade, kids come to us. You're like, wait a second. This isn't like my local public elementary. I got an F. And we mm. don't kick anybody out and we don't ask anybody to leave. But we do have a ninth and tenth grade where students realize, hey, I'm better off going to a different school where showing up will give me a C. Mm. 
And so we lose students in ninth and 10th grade. We don't lose anybody in 11th grade. We don't lose anybody in 12th grade. 11th grade usually is a little bit of influx of students coming back. Those eighth graders that left to go play football come back. They usually come back credit deficient. And so they have to start with us in summer session one in May, and we do three summer sessions. And then we build in credit recovery as their elective class so they can graduate on time. And it's usually quite painful, but they do it. Wow. And we have a credit recovery teacher. And that's what they do. They help students recover credits. Man, you're checking all the boxes, Seth. You're doing, you guys are doing awesome, awesome stuff there in Oakland. Thank you for pouring into that. The next generation that's coming up. If you were to leave, uh, as we close out, if you were to leave anybody who's listening, any school leaders across the country tuning in, if you leave them with one piece of encouragement, inspiration, advice, what would you leave with them? There is one thing, and I beg everyone, right now the big E word is equity. Throw equity away and replace it with excellence. If you want to have true equity for your students, you must make sure you are providing them with excellence in their classrooms. That is the way our kids are going to receive equitable treatment, is when they are being taught at the same levels as the fanciest private school. When you have that excellence in your classroom, you have equity. And what I would also say is don't let COVID be your excuse for lowering uh, your standards. I'm mm -hmm. watching it over and over and over again. And all that happens is those kids go to college and they get smacked in the face with the standards they're supposed to meet. Yes, COVID is rough. Yes, sometimes online learning is difficult. Yes, sometimes you have to take five days to go isolate and be on Zoom or in our case on Swivel. Um, that's okay. Don't lower that standard because that kid needs whatever it is that skill that you're teaching during that timeline in order for them to be successful in their careers, in their daily lives, or in higher education. Mm. Cool. Amazing. Seth, thank you so much for taking time out of your morning. I know it's early there to hop on the School Success Podcast. It has truly been an honor. And again, thank you for pointing to the next generation. Uh, we need more people like you across the country and, and in the world for that matter, uh, pouring into that next generation, making them awesome, uh, uh, I guess, additions to society. So thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you. And if there's any teachers listening and you're interested in school work next year, we have four teachers retiring. Look at our website, www.baytechschool.org, and let us know if you're interested in joining a great team. Love it. Thanks, Seth. Thank you. Well, another huge shout out and a thank you to Seth for being on the podcast today. I learned a ton and I hope you guys did as well and are able to take at least one thing. If you can narrow it down to one thing from today's episode that you can take back to your school to make it better than it is right now. Seth mentioned some job openings that his school is going to have for teachers. So if that interests you, please go check out their website. And again, to all you educators that are listening, thank you for pouring into the next generation. It means the world to me. Please keep doing what you're doing. We love you, and we'll be here next time with another episode on the School Success Podcast. We'll see you then.